Yep. Excellent. And then whatever that sees will exist in perpetuity. Oh, I have to sit here and hold it? Mm -hmm. Or oh, listen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. Okay. I, I'm Joe Justice. I'm a Seattle area business consultant. Um, I work up in Redmond now at a company called Solutions IQ, and we do business process consulting. I come from software development, <laughs> business analyst, project management, and now process consulting in general. And the story talks a little bit as to why I thought I could even try to be a business consultant. Because of what I do after work on nights and weekends that stumbled across something, well, maybe valuable, and I'm glad I get to share it with you guys today. If the forward slide button works. Do the bottom one, I think. There we go. I'm the team lead of Team WikiSpeed. That's a project that's run nights and weekends, and it has run since 2006. We've built a safe, affordable, sporty, ultra-efficient commuter car, and the first running prototype of that car to achieve over 100 miles per gallon was built in three months. How is that even possible when existing manufacturing seems to change so slowly? Here we see a mainstream hybrid car took six years to gain an additional two miles per gallon of efficiency. Existing manufacturing, mainstream manufacturing, changes slowly because the cost to make change is high. Here we see a stamped door mold crushing aluminum sheet into the door. This is from Tesla's new Model S plant. That machine that stamps those steel dies costs more than $100 million. It requires specific trained staff to run that machine. And when they want to make a change to that die, which is more than $10 million when you factor the development cost of just that door die. That's then a disincentive to change it. The cost to make change is high. If an engineer wanted to design a safer, more ergonomic, less expensive to manufacture door, they would be asked not to, to withhold that innovation for 10 years to amortize first the cost of that existing door mold. This is typical in mainstream manufacturing. And it used to be typical of software <coughs> development teams. They would have 18 month in the case of software to five year in the case of some software development cycles. In manufacturing, it's typical to have 10 to 15 year long development cycles. Porsche just told us that the current generation 911 will be with us the next 14 years. That means it will be possible to go to a Porsche dealer and buy a brand new, very expensive car <laughs> that was designed by what the engineering team thought customers might want 24 years ago, because then you add the 10-year development cycle. Now, some of that car was developed just five months before the molds were made. Some of that car was developed more than 10 years before they started manufacturing, and then it lasts 14 years. Software teams now do something different. They compress the development cycles. Some software teams, and in fact, if we look at initial public offerings over the last 10 years of tech companies, all the very highest money earners of tech companies use very short development cycles. We start to see a trend that wins out financially. What's fun is it's all based on principles like respect your team and principles based on um, trust pairs of work and let go of traditional control mechanisms. So there's a lot of warm fuzzies in there. But from a purely financial perspective, it's now the dominant model in tech. Well, it turns out some of this could be applied back to manufacturing. In 2008, the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize was announced. It was a $10 million prize purse to see could the world build a car a different way. In fact, could the world build a 100 mile per gallon or higher car that met road legal safety specifications. In 2008, there were vehicles that obtained more than 100 miles per gallon. <laughs> they held one occupant, and they did not meet road legal safety specifications. I joined the X Prize, but in the beginning, it was just me. 
I didn't know how I was going to compete against more than 100 other cars from universities and companies around the world, many of them with quite a bit of funding, funding and full-time engineering teams. I was doing it after work nights and weekends. For me, it was I actually couldn't sleep at night if I wasn't trying to make a difference in environmentally sound automotive. That was my passion. I was completely jazzed about it. But there's only so much that just one person could do, and I didn't know how to compete against MIT, Tesla Motors, Tata Motors in India. What I did is I blogged about everything that went well, everything that didn't go well, and all the blocking issues that I had. And through social media tools and people reading the blog, people began to follow, and then people began to stop by my garage and help. And by the time we had passed every technical deliverable in the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, we had a volunteer team of 44 team members in four countries. So this is the social media effect. It grows for you, or, or part of the social media effect. The social media effect can be even more potent than that, as witnessed by some of the recent Arab Spring happening. In Wikispeed, what it enabled was finding high-power talent. Some people, some thinkers that joined the team, were some of the best in their field. And we did it all because we were united around something that we thought was going to make the world a better place, ultra-efficient <coughs> automotive. We didn't win the X Prize. We tied for 10th in the mainstream class. We did come in ahead of Tesla Motors, MIT, Tata Motors from India. Many companies that had full-time engineering staff and multiple million dollar endowments behind them. And we were a team of all volunteers working out of garages and storage units. <coughs> We developed the first more than 100 mile per gallon prototype built to road legal safety specifications in three months. How is that even possible? We're able to iterate the car in minutes. The car splits into constituent pieces that can be worked on independently. In the pits at the Progressive Insurance Automotive X Prize, while other teams were checking their tire pressure or fuel level, we were changing entire parts of the car. We were then invited to the largest auto show in the world, January 2011, in Detroit, Michigan. 5,000 members of the credentialed press from more than 60 countries, three quarters of a million visitors. We knew we had a very efficient proof of concept, but we knew it wasn't pretty. It was that orange shoe box you just saw one slide ago. And for an auto show, the aesthetics matter just as much as the efficiency and the technical deliverables. We knew we wanted a more aesthetic exterior, but we also knew that that would cost at least $36,000 and three months lead time. So I took time off my day job and I went to composite school. I built with the team many very small models of the car and we tested different methods of composite layout to see if we could identify something that could be done faster and less expensively. We ultimately machined the car out of foam from Home Depot and Lowe's that we got on sale. <laughs> Had that cut by a CNC machine in one day, sanded it down in one and a half days, laid up structural carbon fiber over the top, and had a beautiful car in three days for $800. <clears throat> made out of all structural carbon fiber, which is typically reserved for aerospace and the most expensive exotic automobiles. They liked it so much, we were put between Ford and Chrysler on the main floor of the largest auto show in the world. We were terrified <laughs> and excited, and lucky for us, it went over well. We were put, that car was put in Wired Magazine, Popular Science, Popular Mechanics. Here we're being filmed by the Discovery Channel, the New York Times, online, uh, Forbes Billionaire Club linked to us, and others. The same CAD was done by someone I had never met in person, Rob Moorbacher, who works in Germantown, Maryland, who's currently creating the production mold for our convertible city car. You'll probably see some of us driving this around shortly. <coughs> this is all possible because we're modular. We've reduced the cost to make change by having loosely coupled components, just like software, between the structural members of the car. 
front crust structure is replaceable from the rest of the vehicle so we can evolve the safety mechanisms of the car without having to rebuild the chassis itself, without having to change seat belt anchors or our ABS braking setup. The braking setup is a pedal plate that uh, also contains the steering rack. That's able to be evolved separately and in parallel from every, any other part of the car. Exactly the advantages you'd expect from interface first development, contract first development, and loose coupling and object oriented programming in IT. This is one way it can look applied to cars, and it gave us fantastic benefit and enabled us to compete with, uh, on a global playing field with companies and universities all over the world. Underneath the car, the chassis holds all the modules together. <laughs> that chassis is the lightest, strongest structure currently known to achieve a five-star crash rating equivalency. This is something that some of the teams in here who have very rapid development cycles may be used to hearing, that they have some best in the worlds. Despite that we're a group of volunteers working nights and weekends in garages and storage units, we have some structures that are best in the worlds. And this is something that some of the software teams that work on compressed development cycles have probably heard before about their teams. We're safe because we evolve safety tests for our structures before we build them. In fact, we evolve, we evolve tests for all our structures before we build them. This has taken from test-driven development from extreme programming in the software world. Now, it's common sense as well. And test fixtures and jigs go all the way back to machinist guilds and then, uh, in some sense, into the Paleolithic era. This is not new. But in extreme programming, it's been formalized to a rapid-to-apply, value-driven level that complements business better than any method has previously for test-driven development. So by taking away test-driven development as done in extreme programming, we have results focused very quickly and are able to do things like produce the lightest chassis in the world and most simple, it has 14 parts that achieves a five-star crash rating equivalency. We're lean because we aggressively use less stuff wherever we can that won't compromise customer visible value. So that's something that sometimes seems to be missed in lean adoptions. It's not just drive down the cost. It's not just focus on only what the customer needs. It's maximize, in our interpretation, <coughs> maximize perceived value, actual value, and customer visible value, and only that. And that's where test-driven development complements this to help make us focus. If we have a set of tests that are things like, as Joe, I can drive my car at 100 miles per gallon on the EPA UDDS city driving cycle, or 114 miles per gallon on the EPA HW FET highway driving cycle. We have clear tests about what is ultimately valuable. If we're building towards that test, we know our work is focused. If we're doing work that's not built to pass a test, we know we might be working on, we, we might be on a path that ultimately isn't serving the project and something we can redirect to work that will pass a test. So it gives us tight focus and it immediately lets us know when we're done. So we can celebrate, high five each other, and then go on to take on the next thing. Here Rob Huggins, a recent Seattle area high school graduate, is able to build a Wikispeed car using an $89 band saw and a home-built CNC router to replace a piece of equipment that costs more than $10 million in traditional manufacturing process. That's absolutely an example of lean. We, have, we very intentionally choose inexpensive tools, one, because that's what's more affordable to us as a startup, but two, because our cost to make change is reduced. If there's another, benefit, if there's another method tomorrow that requires very different tooling, we're out a very small amount of money. The router is $2,700 for a CNC precision machining router. The bandsaw is 89 bucks. <laughs> We're not needing to then retrain staff that's specialized around a 10 or $100 million piece of machinery. This is the democratization of precision manufacturing tooling, which has only become cost effective in the last five years. So if a company set themselves up more than 10 years ago, and they used traditional stamped or injection mold manufacturing, kudos to them that was financially the best process known at the time. If a company dealing with manufacturing set themselves up within the last five years, they were right on the cusp. We could see them uh, taking on using subtractive rapid prototyping equipment for manufacturing or a traditional process. If the company is less than five years old, they were just copying their competition and not analyzing the business space carefully because the economics of this space have changed. We're agile to reduce the cost to make change 
anywhere responsible. That's changes in team, tooling, materials, methods, all aspects. When the lead aerodynamicist for General Motors joined Team Wikispeed, we wanted to be able to take advantage of their thoughts, their thinking, and their knowledge immediately. We didn't have to build a new car. The car body for the Wikispeed car is a module. It drops on. So we were able to develop a module with those aerodynamic thinkings and teachings and attach it to our existing car. Now those car bodies, again, are, be, are able to be made in three days for $800. So we very quickly were able to adopt a number of advancements. That's an example of a change in team when we had access to new capabilities. Changes in materials, I've talked about a little bit. The machinery is inexpensive. If we switched to a, a completely different uh, composite system, say we used one that used only solar energy, and we used uh, resin transfer infusion, heated by solar. Because we use inexpensive tooling, it would not be expensive for us to adapt that process. Uh, and changes in process, by having workstations that are intentionally nimble, if you notice in many of the pictures behind me, most equipment is on casters and in an open, in an open floor plan, we're able to change flow daily without waiting for a facility to be end of life to make a significant change to the floor plan. To put that in perspective, in traditional automotive manufacturing, if a company wants to make a minor change to their process, they wait two and a half years for the minor model change of that vehicle. Again, because the cost to make change is high. If they want to make a significant change to their process, they wait five to 14 years for the major model change. If they want to make a drastic change to the flow of their work, they wait 30 to 40 years for that facility to be end of life. Software teams delete a directory, change the way post-it notes migrate across a task board, change source control check-in rules. That means that even though many of the lean, agile, scrum, extreme programming processes used in fast-moving software teams, all those highest IPO companies I talked about on the tech world, even though those processes came from the new, new product development game, which studied physical, um, uh, physical development companies such as Canon and Honda, and come from lean manufacturing processes and lean Six Sigma processes and the interchangeable parts revolution in the British firearms industry. Even though they came from physical examples, they've been refined to a very high level in software because of the rapid cycle of change. Now Wikispeed is not reinventing process. We're not that smart. We're applying those processes back to physical manufacturing exactly as we learned them in software and exactly as they're yielding high results there. We use Scrum to work with our distributed collaborative teams. We work with distributed collaborative teams because evidence has shown they are the fastest method for new product innovation and in <coughs> rapid development. Scrum is the fastest moving, lightest lift methodology to implement an agile <coughs> collaborative team. And it scales very well to distributed collaborative teams. It defines our roles and responsibilities. It greatly simplifies our management. We have three roles as, as proposed by Scrum. We have our product owner, our scrum master, and then team members. That's all as complex as it gets. When you compare that to something like Rational Unified Process with 30 roles, you realize you're able to reduce some amount of overhead when you can think quickly and cleanly about your team, and you're working in a cross-functional team, which has been documented as the fastest way to develop new products since 1986. It's amazing the whole world doesn't run that way, but the highest performing, most profit profitable companies do as evidenced by their Wall Street performance and their IPOs. <coughs> we do all work in pairs. This reduces training that's not productive because it's all on-the-job training. It's all training uh, building useful product. And it reduces the need for most types of documentation. When a new team member joins the team, instead of saying, here's the binder of the current state of the product, or here's your training course, we say, great, join uh, Kurt, join Martin Bell and put together one of our ultra-efficient engines. Immediate on-the-job training. And by the end of that pairing session, both of them will be even more savvy about uh, assembling the ultra-high-efficient engines. And they'll have some, as, some understanding of the engineering behind what makes this whole process work. So they'll be more quickly able to contribute to the engineering of the project and not just be an assembler. In this example, both Kurt and Martin are fairly senior, and they could put together our engines probably with a blindfold on.
but if a new team member joined, they would absolutely join a pair with one of them. Also, we get swarming, where team members all come together to block each other, which is only possible when we all work in this collaborative open space. We don't have cubes. We don't have offices. We're all within earshot and eyesight of each other, so that when someone's shoulders start to slump, we don't even have to wait for someone to say, I think I'm blocked. It's visible even with the body language, and the entire team comes around to solve the problem. What that's done for us is we have yet to run into an issue we haven't been able to unblock as a team. And we were developing something that had never been done before, and in fact was not even known if it could be solvable in 2008 when the X Prize was announced, building an ultra-efficient car. And we did it in record time. So that speaks to the value of the process and swarming to unblock practices quickly. Now, swarming, again, has been known for a long, long time, but it's been formalized in extreme programming. We visualize the flow of our work to avoid any time not spent creatively solving problems. We use value stream mapping from Lean to identify any time not spent creatively solving problems. So first, we define what's the value. In this case, it's creatively solving problems, rapid new product development that yields customer visible value. Then we do a value uh, stream analysis to say, where is that value being added? And where is any time where that value is not being added? Can we responsibly minimize that? That leads to a specific method of shop organization, a specific method of the way we do pairing, a specific method to the way we create our tests that drive our development. That's the governing factor that allows us to move quickly. The tools we use to perform this work didn't exist 10 years ago. It would be difficult and maybe even impossible to implement this approach even just five years ago. So this is brand new. And what's also interesting is all the tools we use are free. This approach is applicable across all industries, from engineering to manufacturing to the medical industry to law to, uh, to government to entertainment to insurance and the financial sector. A probable future is that companies will have to adopt this approach in order to stay competitive or even relevant to their market segments. So what to do about it? If you own a business, identify a member of your board of advisors or board of directors to be a process coach for the business. And then add or identify a member of your team <coughs> to become a process coach for your teams. If you're the member of a team, ask your process coach or your scrum master in your team what you can do to maximize customer visible value or gain efficiencies for the business. If you are the process coach or the scrum master in your team, sharpen your skills at every opportunity and perform a value stream map of your business to identify opportunities for efficiency gain. So what's next for Team Wikispeed? We're more than 150 team members now. We're in 13 countries now. We sell cars now. And now we're using this process to solve other very important and complex issues, like help eradicate polio, like help develop low-cost medical centers for developing communities. Team Wikispeed members typically spend between two and eight hours a week volunteering time after work or on weekends. And we have regular successes with that amount of time. It seems like it actually doesn't require a whole lot of time or even resources to solve complex issues that were traditionally considered wicked problems or potentially even unsolvable problems. It takes a mass amount of creativity properly wielded with a forward-moving process. I would ask you to consider taking two to eight hours a week of your time to rapidly solve problems for social good. Join Team Wikispeed, rapidly solve problems for social good with us. We build ultra-efficient cars. You might help us develop low-cost banking applications for underprivileged, underprivileged neighborhoods, giving banking and investment options that didn't exist before. Or you might help stamp out rotavirus, which has a known vaccine, but there's a vaccine distribution problem with it that, turns out, agile methodologies can, can help unblock. But you don't even have to do it with Team Wikispeed. No matter who you did it with, on your own, or with a group, or with our group using Agilene and Scrum, if everyone here spent two to eight hours a day 
rapidly solving problems for social good, it would be so awesome. It would be like a gorilla high-fiving a shark in front of an explosion. <laughs> and that's the world I want to be living in. Wikispeed and schools. Wikispeed is looking to set up a friendly challenge between neighborhood high schools and if their parents and curriculum organizers are willing, even between grade schools, where they create a module at a time of a car, and then that car is competed against the last year's car. So it reduces the cost for all of those schools because some of the modules are, the entire chassis of the car is $550. If someone says, we can improve the chassis, and that science teacher or that process teacher, which is probably something that maybe is worth considering on the curriculum, where that fits in. Or, or that advertising class, or that shop class, or that social studies, or statistics class, says, we might be able to build a better chassis. Well, the cost is very low. It's 14 parts currently and $550. And they could compete against the previous year's best chassis. If they wanted to make a whole suspension, the suspension is currently just over $1,000. They might be able to do that with less expense, lighter weight, uh, more ergonomic, um, noise, uh, less noise vibration and harshness, and still have the precise handling of the current wiki speed car. We would like you, when you hear that as an initiative for your school, or if you're at all involved in the curriculum planning, to say, I've heard about that. Yeah, that might actually be really worth taking on. There was a study of an underprivileged inner city school where sixth graders used calculus to build a boat. The sixth graders were then tested upon graduation, which also interestingly, they had the highest percentile graduation rate of anyone from that school ever from this experimental program. They also had the highest retention rate of understanding that calculus of anyone ever from that school district, uh, of any group ever from that school district. And the study said it was likely because it was applied. They actually built something that was meaningful and memorable to them using the methods. We've known that for a long time, but it takes a lot of effort to find a teacher that's willing to run the extra 10 miles to build a boat in class when they could just hand out workbooks. And then other teachers come and question, how come your class is all running around and talking and moving things and rustling elbows when they get to my period? They're all jazzed, and it's hard to make them sit down and just read workbooks. <laughs> so they're actually disincentive. I'd like us to say, well, hey, maybe it's actually worth doing because our kids get to be smarter and wield these methods more effectively their whole lives, and maybe that's actually the point. I'd like you to encourage programs like Wikispeed and including Wikispeed in our schools. Wikispeed in the community. This is absolutely the pandering pitch. Join Team Wikispeed and give us stuff. So we use a lot of aluminum and composites. If you know someone who runs or is involved with a metalworking business, Ask them to consider donating or providing a steep discount to organizations like Team Wikispeed. If you know uh, a group that helps do not-for-profit filing, it's tricky to be a manufacturing company that produces a good to sale, uh, a good for sale, and be a 501c3. But we're trying to figure out how to do that. If you know someone with that expertise or a team of people with that expertise, please have them email us. We'd like to figure out how to be an honest-to-goodness 501c3 and manufacture a good that might just change the world. Please point resources that might care about us to us, while you're rapidly solving problems for social good and making the world more awesome. <laughs> Here's me on a hike through the Arches and Canyonlands National Park in Utah doing a no-foot push-up with a 75-pound pack on my back. This is to show off. <laughs> But there is a point worth making as well. It's about evidence-based decision-making. In 1999, I had just seen The Matrix, and I said, I want to learn Kung Fu. Probably not the most enlightened reason. I had some other reasons, too. But I'll be honest, that's what drove me off the t over the top and said, yeah, let's, let's actually take the time to figure out what it means to learn Kung Fu. Um, and I'll, since then, my reasons have become more noble. <laughs> I visited martial arts schools going through the yellow pages, and now I would have just Googled it. And I looked to see was there anyone in that school that had the skills and was exhibiting the traits that were the reasons I wanted to learn Kung Fu. 
Did I see people that were energetic, cheerful looking, but calm, were supporting the people around them, and could do feats that, to my mind, bordered on magical? And there were some of them. And I waited until the end of class, or came in before class, and I asked them, how many hours a day do you spend practicing? The average hour, the average answer I got back was three hours. Wow. I didn't have three hours in my day. I didn't have any time in my day. I didn't know how I was going to fit this in. So I did an experiment. I logged what I spent my time doing for the next week. And in aggregate, all over the week, I sure didn't think so, but I watched three hours of TV a day. I would watch a movie at a friend's house. I didn't really count that as watching TV previously. I just watched a movie. And then I'd watch two movies on weekends with other friends. That's something we would love to do. We'd rent them or watch them on, uh, <laughs> rent the DVDs. Uh, or, or even go to the theater sometime. And then I'd watch some news while I was eating my breakfast. And then I'd watch some news in the evening. And when I added it all together, it was three hours a day. And so I did a second experiment and gave my TV to my mom and took that time and enrolled in one of those martial arts schools. And now I can do crazy stuff like a no-foot push-up with a 75-pound pack on my back in the middle of a hike. And that's an example of evidence-based decision-making which we've all known about for a long, long time. But maybe we could use it a little more often in our own health, in our own capability, in our own process, in our own business process, in our own companies, and in our own projects. So we can build stuff lighter, faster, cheaper. And we can build stuff that delivers maximum customer visible value in an amount of time that no one thought was even possible before. Thanks, guys, very much.